Have you ever wondered just how much forethought goes into crafting a robust math curriculum? Hey everyone, this is Steph from Heinemann, and today we're passing things over to Kent Haynes. Kent is a Heinemann Fellow alum and middle school math educator based in Alabama. He is joined by Dr. Robert Q. Barry III, who is the inaugural Associate Dean of DEI and the Samuel Braley Gray Professor of Mathematics Education in the School of Education and Human Development at the University of Virginia. He is also the immediate past president of the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. Kent and Dr. Barry cover a wide range of topics in their conversation today, from building math classrooms where students feel confident participating, to committing to DEI work in mathematics. Here's Kent with more. As a teacher, I've been a member of a lot of professional communities, uh, from the small PLC of seventh grade math teachers at my school, to the Heinemann Fellowship, the, the National Board of Professional Teaching Standards, and the loose confederation of teachers who post and share ideas on blogs and on Twitter. And the largest of these groups that I've been a part of is the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, or NCTM. NCTM is a massive and multifaceted organization. They run conferences, publish works by math teachers and researchers, make policy recommendations, and collect all sorts of resources for teachers. It's so big, it's a bit hard to summarize all that they do, which is why I'm so excited to speak today with Dr. Robert Berry. Dr. Berry is a professor of mathematics education at the University of Virginia and recently served as the president of NCTM during the COVID-19 pandemic, an important and challenging time for the organization and, of course, the educational world as a whole. Uh, so, Dr. Berry, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Ken. I really appreciate the invitation. Thank you. So I'm curious how you first got introduced to NCTM before you were involved in an organizational capacity sort of at the top levels of the organization, just as a mathematics educator, what was your introduction to NCTM? Great. So my actually, my introduction to NCTM was when in my teacher education program at Odeman University. Um, and in doing that time, I was a, a member of the Virginia Council of Teachers of Mathematics, uh, which is VCTM, which is an affiliate of NCTM, the state affiliate. And so there would be kind of state conferences where I just attended as a as a student. And so that was kind of my introduction from my teacher ed program. But I think when my second my second year of teaching, I actually went to my first NCTM kind of a meeting. It was in Philadelphia. And as you can imagine, as a young new teacher, it's like, wow, if it was just going into the exhibit hall, if you ever been to an NCTM meeting, going into the exhibit hall and you just kind of seeing oh man, this is great. Um, and so, um, so yeah, that's when I, I kind of found myself there and kind of started attending different a regional here and there. My first uh, annual meeting, I believe was in Washington, DC. So I live in Virginia. So I just went to places where I can legitimately drive to. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, there was a re regional, NCTM had a regional in Richmond. They had one in Atlanta. So, I mean, you know, just drivable spaces. I mean, being a teacher, I, you know, I had limitation in the amount of funds that I could use and spend. And so I had to uh, save the dollars where I, I could. So for me, it was just a matter of um, learning as much as I can, learning new instructional strategies, learning, gathering new materials, just really being um, exposed to things that I probably would not have otherwise been exposed to had I not attended uh, any of those meetings. You've sort of already led into my next question, but I, I'll set it up for you anyway, which is, let's say I'm talking to my colleague who works across the hall from me. She's not a member of NCTM. And she asked, you know, why should I become a member? I don't, you know, I just got my state money. I guess I could join, but what do you get out of it? What would you say to her, or I guess, what do you hope that members of the organization would say to their colleagues who are not yet members? Yeah, so I mean, I can answer that question from an experiential point of view. When I was a classroom teacher, I think I probably was, and at the school in which I work, I probably was probably the only member of NCTM at the time. And what I did, I got all three of the journals at the time. I got in, uh, teaching children mathematics, mathematics teaching in the middle school, and the mathematics teacher. And so after I've had 
you know, they come to my home. I would use, learn, gather things from them. Uh, and then I would just bring them into my job and just kind of, you know, I can remember talking to one teacher and just and just telling them, you know, do you need to do this? <laughs> Read this article. I would, I would just kind of pass things along. I know when I attended meetings, um, I would gather like, you know, you know how sometimes vendors hand out free stuff. I would try to get an extra two or three because then I can just give it to folks at where it was possible, where I can gather some extra stuff. I would gather extra stuff and just share it. You know, I then took up the kind of the initiative to kind of become kind of a leader within my school around mathematics because I I wanted to kind of share some of these ideas with 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 my colleagues. But also, there's an interesting convergence, right? Um, while I was a member of NCTM, I started working on my master's degree. My master's degree uh, is is in mathematics education, and I say this because you know, as a classroom teacher, sometimes people listen well. You get a master's degree in ed leadership so you can become a principal, right? <laughs> that wasn't me. I, I, I decided to get a master's degree in math ed um, from a small school, Christopher Newport University. And so even at, at CNU, my advisor there, she was a member of NCTM, and we actually began to do some collaboration and presenting at our affiliate conferences and things of that nature. So it also gave me an opportunity to become a leader in my school division that's how I became a math specialist in, in, in my school from the work I did with my master's um, and working through my master's um, with that. So I began to serve on the textbook adoption committee, having that understanding and and working with our district level math person was significantly important. And and it can quite honestly, by being involved in that, I got a lot of free stuff. So those books that, <laughs> that is important. Yes. So think about this. Those books we didn't adopt because, you know, the publisher would send them. I'm like, I'll take them. I mean, mm-hmm. so, you know, although there were some things that we didn't adopt, there was some still some good stuff that I can use to kind of support my students, support others um, as I needed to as well. And so um, our district level math supervisor, um, and she will pass things along to me because she would know that I would be willing to try. I mean, so, for example, for my master's thesis, I programmed calculators to make errors on purpose. And, and the reason why I did that, because I want to understand students' computational estimation skills. But what that did for me, my district level math supervisor saw me as a person who was willing to try technology. You also got to consider that this is the mid 90s, right? To try out technologies, to try things that others weren't. And so, you know, I'm trying, and it's not like I knew how to do that. I'm sitting there with the manual. <laughs> trying to figure out how I can make this thing work. And so any pieces of technology that she wasn't willing to kind of figure out, she's like, okay, I know someone who might be willing to try it. And I was her guy. I would say I had someone who saw something in me that didn't, I didn't yet see in myself who was willing to kind of feed me, so to speak. And I think she fed me to give me the efficacy to kind of unpack and think about curricula and the resources there. I think it's interesting that there is so much there for, I would say, a self-motivated teacher, somebody who's really interested in getting on the textbook committee or being involved in scope and sequence in their district or these sorts of things. NCTM provides a lot of opportunities and resources and things that just sort of flow towards you if you're interested in that sort of thing. But but it's also the case if you just, if all you want to do is teach math, I do think that a lot of the most interesting activity structures and lesson structures and things like that, that people, they may find at this point, frankly, on social media uh, or, you know, from a colleague, that sort of thing. If you walk it back and you sort of, you know, do the genealogy of where this thing came from, a lot of times it came from a magazine article or even some academic research that was published in a, you know, an academic research journal by NCTM or, or something like that. And I think that's why it's such an important organization its influence on the way that people talk and think about mathematics education is really important. And so for that reason, I'm really interested in talking about one of your big efforts during your tenure as president, which was the Catalyzing Change books, which uh, you can probably describe better than I, but it's a, a series of books for high school education, middle school math education, and elementary school math education, trying to broaden the scope of 
what we see is the importance of math education, why we teach math to students, and also policy recommendations for the education sector at all those levels. Um, I'd love to hear your perspective on what catalyzing change is intended to do and you know what the impact you hope to see from it. Yeah, I mean, so I would say this catalyzing change, the first book was published in 2018. Uh, and at that time, um, Matt Larson was president of NCTM. So he kind of got the wheel going uh, around that. And then the last two books, um, we, the board of uh, directors approved them during my presidency and we got those books kind of going forward. But the common thing across me, all three books are four key recommendations. The four key recommendations is this idea. So what is the purpose of school mathematics and, 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 and really defining those purpose and within that purpose is the idea of what are the essential understandings or the big ideas that kids can know and understand using mathematics to understand and critique the world. We learn math for a reason. And how do we use the mathematics to kind of read and write and understand and critique the world, make sense of the world, uh, those kinds of things. You know? and, I, and I'll give you an example of that. One of the things in my office here is I have a whiteboard outside of my office. And I was working with a group of students here to help them understand, conceptualize how much a trillion is. And I got this idea from... Um, actually from one of the, uh, from the website on NCTM. And so I put a number line on that board and put zero one in and one trillion on the other end and asked them, so where would a million be? And it's interesting how people kind of conceptualize that, right? And so this, while this is a number sense, a relative magnitude kind of task, the relevance and the reading and the critiquing of the world, when we talk about the, you know, um, the president's initiative in terms of building back initiative and the amount of money that's associated with that. What, what, how much is really a trillion, right? How much is that? Right. Uh, and, and then when we begin to market on number line, they realize that a 1 million is really on that number line between zero and a trillion is really close to zero. <laughs> wow. That's a lot of money. Yeah. That's kind of a thousand number, <laughs> but we have this interesting conversation. But the other thing um, uh, within that, the purpose of school mathematics, we want our students to leave math with a sense of joy, wonder, and beauty. You know, this idea of having a positive disposition towards math. And so in that first recommendation is about this sense of joy, wonder, and beauty. Math is beautiful, you know, and, and if kids can see the beauty and the patterns around that. But the sense of joy as, as an educator, the aha moments. But also when kids do mathematics, they should be able to ask more questions than finding solutions. So the second key recommendation is the idea of equitable structures. And equitable structures get at this idea of discontinuing tracking of students and the discontinuation of tracking of teachers. And thinking about math pathways, we want students to continue to study mathematics through high school. We don't want students to end up with what we call a dead-end course. And the way a dead-end course in math is defined, as we defined it in, in Catalog Changes, a course that does, that, that does not lead to the continued study of mathematics. And, and the way this shows up in school sometimes, sometimes we find courses in high schools or even sometimes in middle schools where you know, we need a course that will give students a credit so they can graduate. It doesn't, it doesn't support them for the continued study of mathematics. It's just the intention. Now, I understand the well-meaning idea behind that, but does that really help students for the continued study of mathematics? And so the idea of tracking may sometimes lead students into dead-end course pathways that doesn't really prepare them for the continued study of mathematics. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a math course. It can be about come to the ideas of critiquing and understanding the world. The third key big recommendation is, is, is as I mentioned earlier, is the pathways. And I, I probably blended the second and third one together with the idea of pathways. We want students to continue the study of mathematics. And when we say that pathways, the pathways have to be significant enough that students want to continue to study mathematics. Too often sometimes when students in some states, like in Virginia, uh, in order to get a standard diploma, you only need two credits in math. It's sad to me that some students say, I got my two credits. I am done with math, right? <laughs> and, so, but, and so the question might be, once students get those two credits, are there other things that can be motivating that, that will allow students to continue to study in math? It might mean that we think about other things, the intersection between math and music. 
I could find that as an opportunity for some kids to kind of continue to study. The intersectionary math and other things that might be of interest. And the fourth one is one that is near and dear to me is equitable instruction. <laughs> Identity, agency, positionality, and competency. How do our instructional routines, how do our instructional practices support students' mathematical identity, support agency, and support positioning students as being competent in, in school mathematics? And how do we give students, how do we share authority in our teaching? I know that was a mouthful. I'm sorry, <laughs> but, but, but uh, I, I'll, I'll kick it back over to you. I think it's it's great. It, it shows you how much there is going on in this series of books and how many different levels on which it's operating. Like the last one you just talked about is within the classroom. That's something that <clears throat> that I, as a seventh grade math teacher, have a lot of control over. Right? I have less control over the statewide mathematics curriculum. You know, but but I can also sort of think about the organization's recommendations and and kind of mull them over. And in fact, that's actually the next thing that I want to do because I'm really intrigued by this idea. So uh, to give you context, I teach in Alabama. And recently we moved away from tracking math in sixth grade. So every sixth grader takes the same math class. Then in seventh grade, there is the sort of seventh and eighth grade accelerated option where the students are taking seventh grade math, eighth grade math, and algebra one over the course of those two years, right? And the idea there uh, is that then they can take geometry, algebra two, pre-cal, calculus, right? They, so that students have the opportunity to take calculus as a senior in high school. And I'm a big fan of the move away from the tracking in sixth grade, teaching the material in that accelerated seventh grade course it moves at such a quick pace that it's very difficult for me uh, to believe that all the students are really deeply engaging with the material. But when I bring this up and talk about how it may be moving at too quick a pace or something like that, the big counter argument is, well, what if you have a kid who can take calculus as a senior? What other path is there for them to do that? So what do you think about that? What's, what's your response to that idea that that the only, you know, the only way to to give these uh, students that opportunity at the end of high school is at some point to branch off. The idea of a common pathway is that from middle, well, actually, you know, from elementary school all the way through middle school, through the first two years of high school, that students will share a common pathway. Now, it doesn't preclude that students might, some students may move faster on that pathway, but it does say that students do not skip any mathematics on that pathway, right? And so some students can accelerate if it's appropriate for them to accelerate, but they're not skipping any mathematics. So if you think about this, we know proportional reasoning in seventh grade is significantly. Oh, my gosh. Right? Yes. And so often what happens is that to the rush to get to, cal uh, to, to get to algebra one, sometimes we just skip proportional reasoning with the idea that, it, you know, that is significantly important as for the continued study of math. And so the idea is that that students will have shared this pathway through, but, you know, but there are opportunities for students to kind of accelerate on that pathway without skipping any content. So that's the positionality that Catalyze and Change has taken up uh, along that. The other thing that in Catalyze and Change, the discussion, particularly in high school, is the having the discussion between calculus and stats and statistics. We know that, you know, Less than 20% of careers require calculus, and that number varies, you know, depending on whom you cite. And but somehow calculus is privileged in this conversation, right? And so, if we can think about math pathways as connected to career opportunities, maybe if I am a sixth grader and I see I want to be this. I want to be a dentist. If I backtrack from being a dentist, what math will I need that will provide me the opportunity to go into that space? I think that's a significant conversation that we're going to have to have, right? It's, you know, and this is where industry and, and K-12 and state agencies have to come together to, make, to have that conversation. But what we've been doing is connecting historically and saying, okay, calculus is the gold star. Let's get everybody to calculus. But if we, if we really think about that, you know, we think about what are the career options, the career opportunities. I'm not saying de-emphasizing calculus because, you know, it damages some students. What I'm saying is, is that 
career opportunities should be associated with pathways. So if I want to be, I want to be an educator. What what is the mathematics I need to be an educator? If I want to be a musician, what is the mathematics I need to be a musician? And so it is thinking about those pathways. But the challenge is also, and I get where the discussion may go, well, do kids know what they want to be when they are a ninth, 10th, or 11th grader? Um, and if, if we don't push them to aspire to something that doesn't limit their opportunities, will they now be locked out of options? I'm, I would argue against that because, you know, there are many people who have shifted their career and then had to go back and think about the requisite stuff that they need to do. And so, and I, I would also argue that, you know, the value of having some of those background type of work or whatever decision they make will support them for whatever, if they choose to shift in their options or their thinking as well. So this is where pathways is important, not only when you think about careers, but also post-secondary. I think we have to have a connection between K-12, community colleges, four-year colleges, and of course, industry to build this kind of, so the pathways is just not a K-12 responsibility. And sometimes we miss that conversation. Yeah, it's interesting. As you were talking, I, I realized that because calculus is not a subject area that's required for that many careers, we're most, it seems like in a lot of ways, we're using it as a signaling instrument to say, if a student can handle this mathematics as a senior in high school, they'll be good enough at mathematics that they can handle whatever their their career gives them. Whereas if you think about a student taking calc- uh, taking statistics rather as a senior, that is also a rigorous, you know, AP statistics is a rigorous course, and they're much more likely to actually use that content. I mean, I think about in my position, when I'm looking at, you know, state standardized testing data or progress monitoring data, I think my background in statistics is really helpful for actually understanding what those tests can and cannot tell me about my students, you know, as a cohort and individually. And and sometimes I feel like I'm in a room with a lot of other educators who are trying to parse this information, but don't have the sort of statistical background to really think about it. And, you know, you don't really initially think about, oh, well, I'm going to be a fifth grade teacher, so I need to know statistics. But if you're going to make use of any of the data that you're provided by the state or by the district for these, you know, testing, you really can benefit from it if you're able to parse it with a statistical mindset. And so I think that's, yeah, that's that that really strikes me as, a, as an interesting point. And when we think about the, the, the relevancy of that, right, and how people kind of, you know, their disposition. So also, not only from a pathways and content perspective, but from a disposition perspective, because they, they, they see, you know, not only teachers, but learners see, oh, this makes so much sense. You know, oh, oh I see they, they see the connections in a way that they may not yet see the connections in a, in a pre-calc or calc course in terms of the, the relevancy for how they see the usage of that. And the misusage of that, and sometimes in our popular press, mm-hmm. and how statistics show up uh, in sample size and things of that nature, and how we have you know, and, and, and so, the past two years, uh, the past two years, I feel like has been one conversation after another about the misuse of statistics. It's been right. so, fascinating to me. That's significantly important. And, and, and what if all of us had statistical literacy? How will our conversations be different? <laughs> um, um, how will our conversations be a little bit more critical and more critiquing if we had the shared understanding of liter- statistical literacy um, more broadly? And unfortunately, we don't have the shared understanding. Well, let's let's shift from the things that I have very little control over, like what my state decides uh, high school students take, and and into the classroom. Uh, just for you know, a teacher who's listening to this and thinking about what what do equitable practices within a classroom look like if if we walked into a classroom that was implementing some of these ideas or teaching in the spirit of the NCTM recommendations and catalyzing change, what would we see in that classroom? So for me, you know, if you've heard me speak before, one of the things I often say that teachers are identity builders and the way that we build identity, it's really the thinking about how we connect mathematics to kind of this social competency 
And so the connection between student and student, student to teacher, and giving students the opportunity to demonstrate their agency. So one of the things I think about, sometimes in mathematics, we have this kind of emphasis on mathematical competency as being focused solely on rightness and wrongness of an answer or of a task. And I want us to disrupt that. And I think we can disrupt that in our, in our teaching practices. I think mathematical competency should be based on the willingness to be participatory in the mathematics classroom. Because if a student is willing to be participatory, I then have access to their thinking, have access to how they're understanding the mathematics. And that's more that's significantly more important to me than whether they got it right or wrong. I don't want to say that rightness and wrongness is not something that we should not pay attention to. What I am trying to say is that even when sometimes when students have a wrong solution and they can explain how they're thinking around that, that's valuable to me as a teacher because now I have access to be able to provide some interventions or, or, or provide some support for that student. But if they're not willing to be participatory, then I don't have access to that. So what I want to disrupt is this this idea of how do we, what are our instructional routines that allow our students to be participatory and that competency is based on my willingness, willingness to be participatory. So when I think about instructional routines, I think about some things that are pretty common that some of the teachers in my circle use, like notice and wonder. You know, all kids can notice, all kids can wonder. If I engage in a task, they can notice, they can wonder. And then that way I got them engaged on some level we may not yet be engaged in the depth of the mathematics, but I'm building the engagement initially that they can lead to further engagement, right? The other day I saw a teacher uh, on video who uses this, this routine she calls questions or compliments. So a student presents their thinking whole class. In this case, the student was presenting their thinking whole class. And the teacher you know, asked questions or compliments. And this one student gave a compliment, and then the teacher mathematized that compliment, right? And so I, it, this was, these were young students. The student was solving the problem, but as she was counting, she was keeping track of her count with her finger. She was solving groups of numbers. And so she, she realized she had four groups of, of that number. And so the one kid complimented her on, I like the way you kept your fingers up. Then the teacher said, well, what were you doing when you, kept up, when you were holding up your fingers? So the idea of kind of this participation. We're not focusing on rightness or wrongness. We're focusing on being participatory. And I'm trying to think about what instruction and routines that gives the space for students to be participatory. Um, and that way we build the connection to the mathematics and we build that social connection as well, where students are connected to each other, they're connected to the teacher, and, 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 and the mathematics is, 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 is still centered but it's not, it, it, it's centered in a way that's built around understanding and being participatory. Oh, absolutely. Well, I think it's it's funny because you mentioned you're saying you don't want to de-emphasize the importance of getting, you know, the right answer. And to me, what it emphasizes is the importance of the process of getting students to have a positive disposition such that they will eventually grapple with the math and come to the right answer. I mean, to me, the goal is is still to have more of my students able to master more of the mathematics in the room. And this is just a way of bringing in more of the students in the room so that they feel comfortable enough struggling to actually succeed. Right. There's a video uh, um, that's on NCTM's website where a student is actually is explaining his thinking and on the task, he is obviously has the wrong answer, right? Um, so I'm going to say, I'm going to admit that. Obviously the wrong answer, but he continued to explain his thinking. What I was taken back by in this classroom, there are probably 20 some odd students in the classroom. So this was an algebra one classroom, ninth grade classroom. No one in the classroom said, dude, you are wrong. Oh, no one stopped him. No one shut him down. So there's something about the norms of that classroom even when someone has the wrong answer and there may be other students in the classroom who may have noticed that he, that he had the wrong answer, he was still allowed to be participatory, which then might have an impact on him next week. He's going to still be participatory because no one shut him down. It, 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 so the, the norms is important around being participatory. And so 
you know, so even where, even as a student, I can imagine in this classroom, a student who may not yet have clarity about their thinking, but may have the willingness to kind of say, you know, I don't, I'm really, I'm not sure yet, but here's what I'm thinking about, you know? And so that is the thing that, um, so when we think about identity, when you think about agency, identity is, is, is really how I see myself as a mathematician and how others perceive me. So identity can be this idea of, I see myself as a mathematician because I'm willing to explain and, my, and justify my thinking and offer insights to my ideas around mathematics. So identity is built around being, particip being participatory. And agency is your identity in action, right? And so I'm willing to kind of take up those behaviors of explaining, justifying, engaging with others, you know, connecting with others. And so, and then competency, too often in mathematics classrooms, those who are positioned as competent is the one who speaks all the time, that kid who answers every question. And so how do we kind of distribute competency? It might mean we give space so that everyone can have the opportunity to speak. Or how do we broaden it so that more people can speak rather than the few? It can be the many who are able to speak or all who are able to speak in the classroom. I'm really glad that this conversation went in this direction because it gets to the heart of something I've been mulling over, frankly, since the, the first time that we met at this conference several years ago. Because when we think about equitable math practices, we can think about the idea of equity just meaning I want everybody in this room, no matter what their disposition towards math, to feel successful, competent, willing to participate in the learning in the classroom. But you can also think about it in a more specific in a more specific way based on, for example, um, somebody's racial identity, somebody's gender identity, there are definitely ways in which our educational system is inequitable um, in a way that's a reflection of the larger inequity in American society. So for example, you know, I teach in uh, a very integrated school district, but we see in our, in our building the same sort of disparity in, let's say, average you know, mathematics sco placement scores for white students versus African-American versus Latino students. And so then you see, you know, in the accelerated track, you have a disproportionately white student population. In the intervention classes, you have a disproportionately um, black and Latino population. And these sorts of identities are intertwined with they're mathematical identities. There's, there starts to become an association, I think, in the minds of a lot of students between other aspects of their identity or other identities that they hold and their mathematical identity. So one thing that I've been thinking about is we want to create an equitable environment for all students, no matter their background, no matter their, you know, economic, you know, identity, what, you know, their, their class where they, you know, uh, if they come from a working class family, what have you. Is it too simple to say that good pedagogy, the stuff that you're describing, which I was, we weren't putting any sort of lens on it from the perspective of race or gender or, you know, that sort of thing. But you can imagine saying, yes, um, the people who are seen as competent in a math classroom are the ones who speak up. And, you know, frankly, in a lot of math classrooms, boys seem to be very likely to speak up as compared to girls, right? And so maybe an equitable classroom, a classroom that's trying to balance out that imbalance between boys and girls in their mathematical identity is one that just encourages good pedagogy, right? Making sure that everybody has an opportunity to feel competent. I guess what I'm saying is, is it, <laughs> is it as simple to say that just good basic teaching practice is responsive to these sort of inequities that we see along racial or ethnic lines or gender lines or what have you? I would say to an extent, yes. Um, I think that is kind of, uh, that has to be a baseline in terms of the these the good teaching practices uh, and the, the instructional routines that I described earlier. But also I think we have to be mindful about the patterns of how we affirm students in our classroom or how we begin to acknowledge students in our classrooms. And that's where I think we begin to see where inequities may show up. It is those patterns that kind of, if I'm only calling on the boys to ask them high cognitively demanding questions and asking only the girls low cognitively demanding questions. You know, I, you know my questioning schemes may be instructionally appropriate, but then the patterns may show up on 
who gets what in terms of not only kind of my questioning, also in kind of my in, in terms of my task. One of my talks most recently, I, I described where a practice that we use quite frequently, I would say we, that I'm assuming that many teachers may use this idea of revoicing or restating. You know, sometimes, you know, we might revoice or restate and and I think that's a valuable practice we use in our classroom. But what I notice in one teacher's classroom when revoicing or to restating, it always happened with the students of color. Kids pick that up, right? It's a practice we want to happen, but then the students may be left with, is my teacher restating something because I didn't say it right? <laughs> Can you imagine how a student might in internalize that? So one thing I say, yes, I think we should revoice and restate, but it might be, um, it might be a way we might say, you know, Kent, what you just said was so brilliant. Do you mind saying that again for everyone? Because I want everybody to hear this brilliant thing you just said. Now I position them in certain some type of way, and then the efficacy for them to continue to participate might be there, and they're not left with re, uh, rethinking whether or not the teacher is saying a, a better than I. Or I might say, Kent, what you just said is so brilliant. Would you like to just state it again, or, or would you like for me to state it? Now I'm giving them the option. You know, and so it, it's all of those kinds of things where I, I still want to position Kent as, you know, competent, but also... I'm trying to be mindful of I'm not only asking only a certain kind of identity of student of revoicing, restating. And typically, sometimes when I notice this, I, I notice it in the English and uh, in, in language learners class. You know, and, and, and so the idea that happens as well is patterns where inequities may show up and those patterns students may notice and then students may kind of push back a draw. And so. I think sometimes as teachers, and, 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 and I think it's well-meaning for many teachers, they may not even notice that they're doing it sometimes. Um, and so I think what we have to do is think about our questioning, some of our routines that we where we might invite students, sometimes who gets invited, who doesn't get invited, you know, in terms of, you know, going up to the document cam. It's those students notice, notice patterns. And all of those are great instructional routines, but it's the patterns that I think where inequities kind of discriminate themselves. So I guess it's maybe a more internal checking of oneself to make sure that, okay, good pedagogy is going to create hopefully a more equitable environment in my classroom as long as I'm implementing that pedagogy equitably, as long as I'm mindful of that and, and and thinking, am I giving each student sort of an equal opportunity to participate in this way or, or something like that? Yeah, I, really, I like that framing a lot. So this is where we become kind of this sense of professional collectivism show up. So I'm, now I'm going to invite my, my teacher colleague, Kent, in my class. When Kent, when you come to my class, I just want you to notice, you know, if you can just look at whom I'm calling on and what questions I'm, whom I'm asking questions for, just you know, pick up on that. I mean, just kind of, and this is where I think building community uh, and, and having that sense of community uh, um, among teachers, and I know it, it is it's burdensome because of all the things that are happening um, in terms of we're teaching during COVID, you know, our demands on our on teachers' times are, has increased significantly. But, you know, but I think if, even if, if we can get a five or 10 minute check from a colleague, just to kind of you know, call me out on these things to see if you see, any, see anything. I think I'm doing this, but I'm not sure. If that's not the case, then videotape yourself. And I understand all of those things are risk-taking. You know, they are risk-taking. I've worked with a group of teachers where we use an observation measure. And the first thing we do before we use the observation measure with the teacher, we give them their video and say, I want you to rate yourself first before we do anything with it. And sometimes it's a week or two because like, I, I can't bring myself to watch. Myself. Oh, my gosh. I'm not, I totally know what you mean. <laughs> or, they, they, or, you know, common things we hear is like, I watched the first five minutes. My voice really sounds like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and, and so we, we recognize that. And we, what we try to do is, is, is just kind of understand there's a process you know, of 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 of, of re actually seeing yourself. I mean, you know, how often do we see ourselves teach? <laughs> that is 
<laughs> that is that is, but I think it's significant. It's incredible professional development. It really is. Well, I definitely recommend uh, those of you listening to pick up the Catalyzing Change book, uh, at least for your sort of age level of mathematics teaching, because I do think it's is very thought provoking, and I think it's a really great resource to spur conversations within your school district, within your school. And I, and, and I'm glad that NCTM took on this sort of, and has for decades, frankly, taken on these sorts of big sweeping uh, projects like this. So I, I guess to close the, the one thing that I'm curious about is uh, your tenure as president of NCTM is over now. And of course, to some extent, uh, the best laid plans of the organization were waylaid by the you know, COVID-19 pandemic, as were uh, everybody else's. <laughs> what do you wish that you had been able uh, to accomplish? Or what if you, you know, were, were still at the helm, helm of the organization, would you be aiming for? What, what do you see as sort of um, what you hope for the future of the organization? Thank you. Thank you so much for that. So I would say this, but... So one of the last things I had to do as president of NCTM, so NCTM Centennial Celebration would have been in Chicago in 2020. One of the last things I had to do as president was cancel the Centennial Conference. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, um, so that was that was a challenge, but it was the right decision to make. I mean, we we didn't have any information about how COVID was going to happen at the time, but I would say one of the things I'm pleased that we did we pivoted and did 100 days of professional learning. And so I was very pleased with that. But as I think forward, I am hoping that uh, NCTM still has the impact that it has on policy, has the impact on teaching, uh, begin to make decisions about um, advocacy. One of the things that we did pre-COVID w- when I first became president, we began to begin pushing to advocacy spaces. And I wanna make the distinction, we weren't lobbying, we were advocating. So, we went to Capitol Hill twice and advocated and met with representat- representatives, both in the House and the Senate, to just kind of introduce those representatives to NCTM. We introduced them to the high school catalyzing change. We had kind of some smaller policy one pagers that they can then use because we were talking about those bigger kind of structural things that we hoped that would happen to school. And that kind of got disrupted because I think we were having some synergy because the plan was then while we're visiting the Congress, what if we did some training with our state affiliates and have them to visit state houses? What if we did that? So our state affiliates began to do that and and what kind of energy would happen? So I'm hoping that NC Tim will move once it is safe to move into the space of advocacy around some of the changes that we hope to have an impact on structurally and policy wise, not not only in mathematics education, but more broadly in education. And so I think we had a good thing going if just that we were interrupted uh, with catalyzing change because that was the intentionality of catalyzing change. You know, we want to have the classroom impact, but you know, we got to go to those people who are making those kind of broad decisions, you know, at the national level, but also at the state level. And so that was the plan to not only go to to Congress, but also go to our our state houses and empower our state affiliates to move into their state houses. And that's something I see a future for organizationally. And and, and once, whenever that time comes, um, I think it will be great for us to kind of have that kind of impact as well. I think that's very exciting. It makes me uh, really excited to get more involved with my state affiliate because I know so much of educational policy happens at the state level and it's not uh, been sort of a big focus of my, you know, my professional work outside of the classroom. But hearing you say that, it makes me really interested in it because you're right, that it could have a big impact at the, at the state house. And that is the thing. I mean, that is, you know, building our, strengthening our relationship with state affiliates and providing them with the resources, you know, you know, even to the extent of the training that we did to go, we we actually had people to train us in terms of when we went to Congress, how to interact with the different representatives and, you know, your three points. They don't have time to listen to your whole thing, but you got to hit them with three points. When they walk away from you, they're going to know what what those three points are. 
And so I think the same, I think we can do the same training with our state affiliates to have the impact at the state level as well. Well, I can't thank you enough uh, for coming on and talking to us about this. And I really hope that everybody goes out and picks up Catalyzing Change and and frankly joins in TTM uh, and, and takes advantage of the many different resources, whether it's the monthly magazine with teaching ideas or some of the journals, the conferences, uh, again, once we can convene more frequently, uh, have always been a really uh, enjoyable time for me. Um, so uh, thank you so much, Dr. Barry, and uh, I appreciate it. Our thanks to Kent and Dr. Barry for their time today. You can learn more about Kent and his work at gamesforyoungminds.com or on Twitter at Kent Haynes. Dr. Barry can be found on Twitter at Robert Q. Barry. Learn more and read a transcript of this episode at blog.heinemann.com. The Heinemann Podcast is a production of Heinemann Publishing. It is produced and edited by Steph George. Sound mixing by Steph George. Our creative producer is Lauren Audette. And our executive producer is me, Brett Whitmarsh. To learn more about the Heinemann Podcast, visit blog.heinemann.com. Thanks for listening.